Um, who is not here? We're missing somebody. It, did Brianna, Brianna's here? Uh, I don't see Esther. Esther's missing. You hear Esther? No, okay. So, can you see the textbook? Yes. Okay. All right, let's explain the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. This is a concept similar to compartment syndrome. Right, so in the brain, so this is um, who wants to be the Okay, so this is the this the brain. Oh, no, this is not. This is I'm trying my best. Okay, all right. So this is Whitney. Okay. All right. So what's in Whitney's skull? So this is her cerebrum, and this is the tentorium right here. And then we have the cerebellum. And then we have the midbrain somewhere there. And then we have the brainstem. And then the spinal cord. All right. So the Monroe Kelly Doctrine says, in an intact skull, this is what happens when there is an injury in there. So we have three things inside the skull. So we have brain tissue, we have blood volume, which are in the vessels, and then we have cerebrospinal fluid. So somewhere here, there are ventricles there where your CSF are, are stored. So it's in the middle. There are two large ventricles there, and then they're distributed throughout the brain for shock absorption. So this is about 80%, this is about 10%, 10%. Technically, it's 78, 12, and 10, but you know, 80, 10, 10. So that's 100%. So just like a cup of water, if you fill a cup of water to the brim and then you add one more drop, what will happen to that drop? Can we accommodate one more drop? Overflow. No, no. no. something, another drop has to spill out, right? Did that drop spill out? Was no. It no, something else was displaced, right? Yep. All right, so this, this is the same here. So it's already full. This this place here is the, the whole skull is already full. We have no place else to put anything. If we increase blood volume, Let's say you went out drinking and then uh, had too much drinking, so uh, a lot of tyramine, so you have cerebral, I mean, yeah, cerebral dilation, um, so that will increase blood volume. You get a splitting headache in the morning, so that's a hangover, so that increased intracranial pressure, correct? So okay. if you have a, let's say, a CSF production or drainage problem, so let's say the CSF production is increased or the CSF drainage is blocked. So that will increase the volume of the CSF, still increasing intracranial pressure. ICP, by the way, must be between 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury only. So again, I'd like to emphasize the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. This concept here only applies to an intact skull. We are not going to apply the, the doctrine. We cannot, if if the patient is an infant or a small child because they have open fontanelles, they have open suture lines, so therefore there is room to expand. Not so in a grown-ass adult because the suture lines are closed, there are no fontanelles, so there's nowhere for, uh, there, there's no opening 
Okay, so if this patient suffers an, uh, a close head injury, when Roe Kelly doctrine applies, this is what's going to happen. So if you increase volume, let's say I punch Whitney, I asked Whitney out and then she said, no way. So um, I was so full of rage. So when she went out from work, I hit her uh, twice. You know, I was up on a stool. I was standing on the stool. And then when she dropped by, boom, I hit her here. And then she hit her head also against the wall. So she had two injuries here. So I hit her here and then the brain bounced back here as she hit the wall. So now she has two areas of lacerations and bleeding. So now we have an increase in her brain tissue as well as an increase in blood volume because now the blood isn't in the vessels. It's now somewhere here around in between brain tissue because now they're going to form a hematoma. So now we have an increased volume and the Mon Monroe Kelly doctrine says it as shown here, if volume in one of these components increase, then volume from another component must be displaced. It's only, you know, it, it's only natural. That's what's going to happen. So if you add volume in, or you increase volume in any of these, you have brain edema and swelling, for instance, or if you have a hematoma formation, or you have an increased production or decreased uh, drainage of your CSF, that will increase the volume and there's simply no room. And the only opening in the skull is this thing right here. This is the foramen magnum wherein your spinal cord exits. We cannot, there is no opening. It's not true that if you put your finger far enough, you can reach your brain, right? There are sinuses here, and then there are bones, the sphenoid bone. In fact, if you remember hypophysectomy in adrenal um, tumors, the doctor had to remove sphenoid bone in order to reach the pituitary gland to do the surgery, right? So here, something has to be displaced. So let's say we display CSF. It's only 10%, though. That's not a lot of compliance. Okay, so we don't have, so it's, let's say brain tissue swelled by 20%. And then blood volume also, the hematoma accounted for another 20%. Where are going to find 40% volume? There's, there's none. Uh, even if we, if it's possible, which is it's impossible to displace the whole entire 10, there's still 30% uh, increase in volume that we have to account for. In case something has to be displaced. So here, because this is the only opening, and so if ICP increases to, let's say, 20 or more because of the injury, what will now happen? Sabine, what do you think will happen? Because uh, it's impossible to have 101% or, or even more. It is only 100% possible in there. It's going to have intracranial pressure. Yeah, there will be increased ICP, but what will now happen inside the skull? Because we have to account for these increases right here. There will be a swelling. Yeah, that's why that's what um, caused the increase because the brain tissue swelled and there is bleeding in there. There's hematoma formation here. This was actually the same concept in stroke, in hemorrhagic stroke, uh, which you talked about uh, two semesters ago. So what will happen to brain tissue? Raisa? The crosses. Because just like here, we, we said the, the cup of water, when you put another drop, volume in another component must be displaced. So the, the hematoma here and the brain swelling can't reach this area here because they're too far. So what Just like in an elevator. Yeah, in an elevator, for instance. If, if the elevator is full and then I go in, you know, they can only fit, let's say, 15 people, and I'm the 16th. Can I enter? No. But 
I'm already in there. Let's say just like here, I, I, I entered from the top. So now I entered from the top of the elevator. So I opened the, the, the roof or the ceiling and then I entered. So who's going to be displaced? The The one closest to the door, right? So who is closest to the door here? Who will this guy be? Who is this? Yes, With this drop that's going to come out. CSF. Okay, initially it may be CSF, but again, look at this increase here. That's 24%. Is that spinal fluid this then? is only 10. Sorry? Um, no, nothing. Um, I don't know. Never mind. So, who is this that has to go? Brentition. What was that, Gladys? The brain tissue. The brain what? Tissues. Uh, which part though? Again, this is your cerebral, uh, cerebrum. This is cerebrum, cerebellum, midbrain, brainstem. The brainstem. Okay, the brainstem. And then let's review. So if the brainstem herniates, what is the, what's going to happen? Which one is bigger? The opening or the brainstem? Brainstem. The brainstem. The brainstem is bigger than the opening. So if you squeeze something larger into a smaller opening, what's likely to happen to that tissue? Interruption. No. Just like uh, uh, evisceration. Compression. All right. So compression of the vessels supplying it, right? So yeah. this is, in, in this sense, this is now compartment syndrome. This is the most rigid, com rigid compartment in the body, the skull. In our uh, arms, legs, or the torso, there's some give there. I mean, the, 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 the skin can stretch. Can you stretch the skull? No. No, it's very rigid. It's, uh, it's impossible to stretch. So with all these increases here after Whitney, I hope that, you know, she learns a lesson next time I ask her out. She know better than to say no. So now it will now push the whatever whoever is closest to the opening. It will push it out, even if it doesn't fit. So as a result here, there will be strangulation of the brainstem as it exits through the opening. So causing um, the compartment syndrome uh, signs and symptoms. So if you recall, why did, why was there six Ps in compartment syndrome? What were those six Ps again, Vangelica? Okay. Or oh, anybody? Uh, Linda. Pain, pain, pain. Okay. Pallor, pressure, pressure, pressure. pulselessness, anesthesia, paralysis, paralysis, very good. Paralysis. All right. So what caused these six Ps to appear in compartment syndrome? Pressure. Yeah, we have one pressure. So what caused these to appear? So why did the leg, the arm, Obstructed blood present? Blood Say that one more time. I, I missed that. You cut off the circulation. Oh, right. You squeeze, yeah, because you're squeezing because now you have the dressing, the cast, uh, or whatever was around the leg or the arm acting like a tourniquet, right? preventing blood uh, through arterial, venous, lymphatic, as well as nerve uh, supply, it's all compressed. So no blood flow, no nerve impulses, no um, lymphatic drainage. So that's why the six piece appear. Will the same six piece appear here? Right, yes. Yes, so that's why let's review what is the purpose of the brainstem. So it's responsible for respirations, blood pressure, 
And there's also your reticular activating system is there, you know, the, uh, the center of consciousness. So that's why the earliest sign of increased ICP is a change in the level of consciousness. Um, where's better? Yeah, heart rate also. So your vital functions are controlled by the brainstem. So is this fatal potentially? It's fatal, very fatal. Yes, so head injury, uh, especially severe head injury, or any increase in ICPs, which is also what's going to happen if you have a hemorrhagic bleed. So it's just a matter of what's causing the increase. So it could be a, a hemorrhagic stroke. It could be severe trauma causing the bleeding there. You have a lot of hematoma there. Or, or it could be also um, hydrocephalus. All right. So um, any question about the um, concept of uh, this, this concept right here? We're good, right? Right. All right. So let's yes. go to... All right, so if you read these, that's uh, what we all talked about. So you read that part on your own. Uh, let me just talk about the Cushing's triad real quick. So this is now a result of herniation. So whichever part of the brain herniates, it could be the only the brain stem, or it could also include the cerebellum, or it could also herniate the, it really depends where is the injury, where is the that component that increased in volume? Was it a tumor? Was it a hematoma, All right? What, whatever is growing, for instance. So any part of the brain can herniate. Um, if I go back to the clipboard, I mean the whiteboard. So it could also be here. So let's say you have a tumor growing here and this is the tentorium here. Okay, so this is kind of an imaginary sep um, Sorry, We don't see your screen, here. Professor. Oh. How about now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you have a gr big tumor growing here. So, of course, on top of the herniation for the brainstem and the cerebellum, this cerebrum could also herniate past the tentorium. So the tentorium is like a, because um, the skull normally is smooth surface right here. And then there's a little, little spine here. There's a little spine. Uh, it's a, like a put small protrusion of the skull, which separates the, the um, this is called the tentorium. So this will be supra tentorium. This will be the infra tentorium. So this, this part here can also herniate See the shape of the, the skull here? There's a, uh, a little spike here. And that means the, the uh, cerebrum can also herniate down if you have something growing here, either a hematoma, a, a tumor. So it can also herniate the, the um, uh, and there's a, another piece of the skull here. So it can also herniate out. So this is what we call central herniation. Then we have, um, uh, uncle or uh, downward um, uh, herniation. And there's also lateral herniation. So it can herniate um, four different ways. No, uh, three different ways. Downward, sideways, or both downward and sideways. Either way, however, the, the brain herniates, there will be a consequence of no poor circulation, it will cause ischemia inside the brain. So when the brainstem herniates, this will be your signs. The Cushing's triad will appear. The triad of symptoms are, there will be a decreased BP, no, no sorry, increased systolic BP, with decreased BP, uh, diastolic BP. So therefore you have a very wide pulse pressure here, heart rate drops, and then there will be an irregular respiratory pattern. In other textbooks, the triad is only systolic, uh, increased systolic blood pressure, 
bradycardia, and wide pulse pressure. Okay, those are the triad in other authors. This author included chain stokes respiration. This irregular respiratory pattern here is called chain stokes respiration, which is a pattern of um, hyperventilation, hypoventilation, and apnea, periods of apnea. So very irregular breathing pattern. So um, I don't know what to use. But anyway, um, just be aware that the Cushing's triad can be either increase uh, SBP uh, with wide pulse pressure and then bradycardia, or it could also be increased systolic blood pressure, bradycardia, and irregular uh, or change stokes respirations. All right. Uh, so here are examples. So this mass here, this could be a hematoma, this could be a tumor, whatever. So it let uh, this is the uh, tentorium I'm talking about. So this is a um, a uh, sharp um, part of the skull that separates the um, upper from the lower parts of the brain. So it will cause herniation like this. So here's another uh, spine here. So that will, your, your brain can, this is called sideways, downwards, or you can also have uh, both. So both will occur, right? So you have different ways to herniate the brain. Um, as far as edema goes, I don't really have to test basogenic, cytotoxic, or transsependimol, whatever that means. Uh, edema is edema. So if there is edema in the brain, of course, that will increase blood volume. That will increase um, um, cerebral tissue volume. So it will all, um, all of those, all types of edema, regardless of the type, how they form, because the difference really here is just how did the edema form, all right? Regardless, they will increase intracranial pressure. I am not testing specific uh, herniation syndrome, so you can skip table 39-1 because I believe that's um, the doctor's prob problem only. Um, here types of cerebral edema also, again, regardless of how it formed, it's, it's occupying space, it's going to increase brain tissue, it will increase ICP. So our main concern here is to recognize signs and symptoms of increased ICP and then institute interventions for increased ICP. So our baseline is 10, uh, in normal increase, uh, normal intracranial pressure is 10 to 15. So uh, we said that the earliest signs of increased intracranial pressure are changes in the level of consciousness. Uh, now and every now and then we get increases, which are normal. Uh, for example, when you sneeze, when you're having a coughing fit, or when you're having, um, uh, let's say after a drinking binge, for instance, you have a hangover uh, and you get a splitting headache, those are minor increases in ICP, which we can handle, there's no problem. Yeah, it, it does increase, but doesn't lead to brain herniation, right? So there will be some CSF that's going to be displaced. Uh, some blood volume will also be displaced, but. Um, those are minor, so that's fine. How do we monitor ICP? Uh, we have um, monitoring devices. The number one is, uh, well, we, let's start with non-invasive first. So we can use the Glasgow Coma Scale. You still remember the GCS? from Fundamentals of Nursing? Yes. Okay, so uh, please uh, practice those. Maybe I'll send you a um, exercise so for you to practice. Um, somebody remind me. All right, so our 
um, non-invasive is to use the Glasgow Coma Scale. So we have the best eye opening, best motor response, and best verbal response. So the scores are uh, highest is four for eye, six for motor, and then five for verbal. Um, please um, review those. Uh, you're allowed to brain dump on the test, and you can write it down as soon as we start testing. You can write it on a piece of paper, but uh, of course you cannot uh, use one for the exam. All right, let's go to the concept of cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, this is a also called cerebral blood flow. Okay, so this formula is going to calculate or measure cerebral blood flow. So this is how much pressure is the brain receiving. Normal cerebral blood flow is, I know it says here above 60, but I would put it at 70 to 100 because if it reaches less than 60, neurons or brain cells start to die below 60. So do you want it at 60 or no. you want it around 70? I would go for 70 because there's not a lot of room to give there because the moment it hits 59, some brain cells already start dying. So this is the formula. So when I give you a situation, uh, which is what's happening in a patient with increased ICP. So you have a patient who had a motor vehicle accident, for instance, fell into the tracks, got mugged, was drunk and fell off the stairs, was drunk and fell off the, on the, to the tracks, had a seizure and then fell onto the tracks, whatever the cause of the head injury is. So there will be increased intracranial pressure and you need to keep monitoring them. Now, how do we know that there is enough blood flow to the cerebral tissues? The formula is MAP minus ICP equals cerebral perfusion pressure. What is the formula for MAP? How do we get mean arterial pressure? MAP minus ICP is equal to MAP. No, uh, MAP, the, the mean arterial pressure. How do we calculate that? Oh, uh... CPP plus ACP is equals to MAP. No, just this, just the, just the MAP. It doesn't work like that. Wherein you know you, I know you're doing algebra. Uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't go. You know the other way. You have to calculate MAP separately. So what? How do you derive mean arterial pressure? Let's say my blood pressure is. 120 over 80. What is my mean arterial pressure? It's 40. Alrighty, so let's review that. All right, so. Isn't it just the average of the arterial pressure through like one? Um... No. Uh, MAP equals two times your diastolic plus your systolic blood pressure divided by three. So if we have a blood pressure of 120 over 80, so 80 times 2, 160 plus 120, 280 divided by 3. So we 280, right? 289. And because yeah, it's, it's 280 divided by 3, 927. So 93.33. Okay. So let's say 93. Let's just say 93. And now we have CPP, which is MAP minus ICP. Okay. Let's say our. I don't uh, see anything. I don't see any more writing. I do see it. Why didn't you say it so? No, I see it. I don't know. Maybe it's just you different. Yeah, but now. 
Hello? I see it. I do see it, so I don't know, maybe. Yeah, um, I see it. Oh, now I see it. Thank you. Who doesn't see it? You're good. All right, so I'll backtrack. So MAP is twice your diastolic plus your systolic divided by three. So if it's 120 over 80, <clears throat> so that means 160 plus 120 to 80 divided by three. So that's 93.3 something. And let's say your ICP is 21. What is my cerebral perfusion pressure? It is 72. All right. So as the ICP increases, so let's say I go um, and then I have bleeding because there are uh, secondary injuries that follow the primary injury in uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, which we'll talk about next. So if my blood pressure, let's say I, I drop my blood pressure. So I now have 110 over 60, which is still good, really, right? But not in the sense, in, in the setting of, of traumatic brain injury. Because now, as my ICP decrease, uh, increases and my blood pressure decreases, look what happens. So if my blood pressure is 110 over 60 and my ICP is, let's say, now 25, what is this now? So 60, 120, 230, divided by, by 3. 76. So 76 minus 25. So that is now uh, 40, no, 51. Is this good? Is 51 good? No, no, no. no. I'm brain dead <clears throat> at this point. So see what happens to, to um, a CPP. So do I want to lower my blood pressure when I have a brain injury? No. 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 So th this is different from what you learned in stroke? What did you do in stroke? Did you lower the patient's blood pressure? We no. Do. Only if it reaches 180, 110. <clears throat> Remember? <clears throat> But our ideal blood pressure in stroke, remember, we wanted to keep it around 140 over, or 150 systolic. Remember? So this is the reason why we, we wanted the, the brain, uh, the stroke patient, the, regardless, regardless if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, we wanted the blood pressures to stay high. Okay, we only gave labetalol or nicardipine if it reaches 180 over 110. But otherwise, we leave it alone. In fact, we encourage, we're, 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 we're worried if the blood pressure drops, we give the patient fluids, you know, we, we want to increase the blood pressure because it's very hard to decrease ICP based on this concept right here. So what we did here, you know, in, in, the, um, in the discussion on Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So it's extremely hard to, um, to decrease blood pressure because, I mean, uh, to, to, in, to decrease ICP because you'll have to do craniotomy. You'll have to open the skull in order to relieve the pressure. That's the only way. Because uh, other non-invasive ways is, you know, there's no... There's very little compliance, if any, in, in the skull because it's a very rigid compartment. There's not a lot we can do uh, as far as um, decreasing ICP goes. All right. Any question? All right. It's almost time. Let me just finish the concept. Okay. So we have devices, so we know how to calculate mean arterial pressure. Now let's go to how do we um, measure ICP? It has to be invasively uh, monitored. So you have the, oh, I thought there was a table. There's none. All right, so the methods of monitoring ICP is uh, it has to be measured internally. You have to put something into the skull. 
So we have different ones, uh, different ways. We have the bolt, subarachnoid bolt. We have the, or it's also called the um, metal bolt or screw. Um, anyway, whichever one you use, the uh, they are invasive. So it goes into the skull and into the brain because we have to measure it in there. Uh, there's no non-invasive way to, to measure. You have to put a device inside and then attach it to a transducer. Transducer is a pressure monitoring uh, equipment. Um, the most commonly used is uh, something called an intraventricular catheter right here. So this IBC is the most popular because it has two advantages. One is um, the same as the screw or the bolt. It can measure ICP, no problem with that. However, no other method can drain CSF. So IBC can serve two purposes here. So we have uh, to measure ICP, but also you can drain CSF here, which can help lower ICP. So that's the uh, advantage of having a uh, an IBC. Uh, it says here there's a figure. Where's that? Oh, right here. So here's the figure. So this is the IBC, and these are the other methods. You have the intraparenchymal screw or bolt. Uh, the others are incapable of draining CSF. So uh, IBC is therefore preferred because you can put it into the ventricle. That's why it's called intraventricular catheter. The doctor inserts it right into the ventricle and he can drain uh, CSF. So not only monitoring, oh, there is a table. Um, so here, IBC, I'm only testing the IBC. Okay, so you don't have to read the other ways in order to monitor it. So since again, the most popular is the IBC, uh, here, gold standard. So uh, actually, I've never seen the others, uh, to tell you the truth. I've only seen uh, IBC in practice. Uh, so this is nice. So this it's, it's attached to a, a transducer. And there's a leveler, because we need to make sure the, the transducer and the IBC is level. You know how we use a leveler when you're hanging pictures? You know, with a, that little ruler with a little air bubble yes yes, so yes. what do you call that yeah. thing it's yeah a something level. Like, a level. level yeah so it's <laughs> it's exactly like that so we have something like that on the on the setup right because we need to know that the head of the patient and the transducer at our level so we need to um level the the two devices because the if it's not level then it's not accurately measuring the pressure and the pressure is, is necessary, as you can see. We, we need the accurate ICP in order to calculate the CPP uh, for sure, because our calculations, if they're off, that could mean the patient's already brain dead without us even knowing it. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, here are your... Um, changes. So these are the signs of how the patient will appear for uh, increased ICP uh, versus cerebral herniation. So here you still have some brain function, this one no more, patients unresponsive as well as as far as pupils go, there is a reaction even though it's sluggish or has changed shape. Ovioid is like an oblong. A, um, you see a cat's eye? Who has pets here? If you, if you look at the pupil of a cat, they don't have a circular pupil like we do. They have a, they have a weird um, uh, pupil shape. So it's like ov ovoid. Uh, so that's the closest thing. That's the, the cat. The cat has a ovoid shape um, pupil. So this one, if the cerebral, there's already cerebral herniation, um, these are now the changes in your pupillary reactions. And motor, this one will be hemiparesis or even um, abnormal um, positioning. This flexor positioning is called decorticate, and the extensor positioning is called decerebrate. 
uh, I'll give you the spell, spelling later. We get to TBI. And of course, uh, no change in the vital signs here in increased ICP, except maybe the blood pressure goes high, that's it. But pushing striad appears in cerebral herniation. So you can say, is seeing the pushing striad good or bad? If they appear on your patient, is that good news? Bad. Very bad. Very bad. Bad news. Yeah, uh, it's a late sign actually. Um, and there's not much we can do when they appear. Most severe tra traumatic brain injury patients die about 24, maybe 48 hours. They'll, they'll reach 48 hours uh, after admission, but that's it. Um, it's very poor prognosis. Uh, all this is saying here, oh, we have a picture. Okay, here's the leveler. So this is what I mean by the transducer must be at the level of the, um, the patient. So remember, we have to move this patient. We're turning them, right? We turn them, let's say, this because they're unconscious, they're intubated. So we have to clean doo-doo. So if they have this monitoring device, you'll, have a, you'll need a team there in order to make sure our transducer is stays at level. Okay, so a few seconds of, um, that's fine, um, but re just remember to put it back to the level when you're done messing with a patient, all right? Because again, we need an accurate reading here. Uh, so this is how you can drain CSF. So uh, you constantly report, so you call the doctor for the patient's ICP, and then he'll give you an order, okay, drain how, however many mLs of CSF, okay, and then you just simply open the stopcock right here, open it, and then it will drain some CSF. That way you can help not much, you know, it, it won't really significantly lower ICP because CSF is very, um, it's only 10% of the total um, volume inside the cranium so it, it won't really but it's better than nothing um, okay so here uh, this part here explains why you need to distinguish between supra versus infratentorial uh, because that will determine which part of the brain will most likely herniate Um, don't worry about this. I'm not. This is just telling you about compliance. But either way, what happens is because of the structure of the skull, it's rigid. There's not much room to grow, unlike if we're talking about an arm, your torso, or your legs. There is some compliance there, meaning you can accommodate increases in volume there before you get compartment syndrome. You don't have that in inside the brain. Okay, there's very little compliance there because of the structure. Let's go now to how do we, um, what are our interventions? Let's do cat, um, diagnostic first. There's really no blood tests. I mean, there's no blood test that will tell you whether there's increased ICP or not. It's only a CAT scan, an MRI. So patient goes into CAT scan or MRI to get a diagnosis, as simple as that. So we'll just skip through that. That's all the same. Um, as far as um, sodium um, blood test, this won't tell you that there's increased ICP. However, this will be monitored uh, because there's something called uh, salt wasting syndrome in stroke in, or traumatic brain injury. This occurs when there is increased ICP. So you have to mo monitor because remember what happens if you have hyponatremia? What will happen to the brain? Have, uh, seizures. Right, because it will cause in uh, cerebral edema if your sodium is low. 
So it will cause the brain to swell, therefore increasing ICP. And vice versa, if you have a high sodium, it will also dehydrate the brain and will also de this time decrease cerebral blood flow. Now this occurs because two complications result. If you remember when we talked about diabetes insipidus and SIADH in NUR241, one of the causes was traumatic brain injury, brain surgery, or stroke. Okay, so the patient will have these complications whenever they have increased ICP. So you have your SIADH, diabetes insipidus, and like I mentioned, salt wasting syndrome. These can occur in uh, brain injury, regardless of what caused the injury. It could be a brain tumor, a uh, stroke, uh, regardless if it's ischemic or hemorrhagic or traumatic brain injury. Medications, our most commonly used in stroke or any brain trauma patient is os um, osmitrol. So that's mannitol. We give this a lot. Um, you guys are lucky here because you guys grew up with IV pumps. I had to give this thing manually, which is, uh, I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, anyway, the um, mannitol is a osmotic diuretic. So you give this frequently to these patients in order to pull water out. Uh, it's an it's a osmotic diuretic. So un, unlike other diuretics that, that act on the kidney, this one will act on the cells. It will literally pull water out of the interstitial spaces into the bloodstream and then delivers it to the kidneys for it. Right? It's, so it's not like other diuretics. So this one has the same effect as 3% saline here. Um, hypertonic saline, which is 3% saline, they have the same effect. So they will pull water uh, out of the um, out of the extravascular space. So either from the cells or from the interstitial space into the bloodstream and then for excretion in the kidneys. So very good for decreasing cerebral edema, regardless of the type of edema, whether it's cytotoxic or uh, vasogenic. Um, this one though has, will crystallize. Um, so therefore you have to draw it up with a filter needle because it will produce crystals whenever it's exposed to air. So while, while preparing this medication, when you, when you draw it up, if you spill some of it onto your skin or to the table, you'll see that there will be crystals. There will be white crystals, there will be white powder that will be left behind. So you need to draw it up with uh, a filter needle from the vial before administration. Okay, so one of the um, effects is, remember the patient has herniation, correct? So brainstem herniates, what happens to your respiratory rate? Uh, increases. Um, well, it's receiving less blood blood supply now. The brain um, the and together. then it decreases. Decrease. Okay, so your blood pressure uh, will rise because that's part of um, auto regulation. However, your heart rate and your respiratory rate will drop. You saw chain Stokes respirations, right? And uh, there's bradycardia in um, in the Cushing's triad. So heart rate starts to drop respiratory rates start to drop. So if your respiratory rate is below 10 now, what will happen to your oxygen level? Low. Decrease. What happens to your CO2 level? It's going to increase. Okay. Increase. Okay. So you have low oxygen, high CO2. Now yes. that in itself, both of those stimuli, low oxygen or high CO2, will cause cerebral vasodilation. So CO2 is a potent vasodilator. So if it dilates vessels in the brain, what happens to blood volume? Go down. 
increase. Increase. What happens to intracranial pressure? Increase. It will also increase. So what's your intervention there? To what decrease it. All right. So you need to keep the CO2 low and keep oxygen uh, high. 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 But remember, these patients already have, they could potentially have um, hypoventilation because of the brainstem herniation. So do we need to intubate these patients? Probably yes. Most likely yes. So you, our intubation will depend on their Glasgow Coma Scale and also their oxygen saturation. So if you see that based on their spontaneous breath breaths that it's not meeting gas exchange, then you'll have to initiate, you know, you call rapid response, intubate my patient. So when it drops to up to uh, below 10, we call the rapid response team. Uh, it's more really from your ABG. So if your PAO2 starts to rise or you see a PAO2 drops below 80, then they have to be intubated. There's no way because remember, they can only take in oxygen from spontaneous breathing. If they're not breathing enough, then there's no way, no matter how much oxygen you you flood these patients with, it, it, it can't promote gas exchange. Okay, so the patient has to be intubated at that point. Mm -hmm. Thank your you. ABGs are abnormal. So here are your <coughs> uh, interventions. So let's start with movement. So these, because these patients are have decreased mobility now because they're not conscious, so we will have to turn, right? Turn them every two hours, and the head of the bed uh, must be. I really disagree with 90 because all other textbooks um, say 30 to 45. Um, so we'll stick with 45, okay? I really don't agree with 90. The reason is if you put 90, what happens to the blood pressure when you put somebody mm. in a sitting position? It, is 90. it drops it. Right. So do you agree that um, 90 degree would be too high? Because remember, yeah. do we need our blood pressure low or high? We need to increase it. We need it high because we need the CPP to be 70 to 100. So 90 degrees would be too high that will drop our blood pressure. Now our CPP will be low. So we need to keep it a little bit lower because we can still drain or maintain um, the head in a neutral position at 45 degrees. So let's stick with 45 degrees. I really so don't we, like add, we do 30 90. to 45. Yeah, 30 or 45. Okay, 30 degrees you. would also help with the uh, bed source, the uh, pressure ulcer. Remember, the higher your um, your your uh, head of the bed, then the more pressure that will have on the ischium, on the, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, sacrum, right? So 30 or 45 would be would be great. So the head should be neutral or the neck should be neutral position because we want to maintain drainage of blood back into the heart. Um, we already talked about oxygenation. Okay, oxygenation is important. Um, how about temperature? Because this is an injury, the temperature may rise. We so, need to decrease the temperature. All right, because again, uh, hypothermia will cause vasodilation again. So we don't want vasodilation here because vasodilation will increase blood volume to the brain. Although technically, yeah, that will increase blood flow, but we don't want any increase in volume either because that will, again, increase the blood volume component, which increases ICP. If none of those interventions, so let's summarize our interventions was positioning 30 to 45 degrees. Uh, we need to keep keep the oxygen high, CO2 low. We need to um, put um, temperature must be uh, maintained normal. Um, okay, and then avoid any, <clears throat> uh, when you're caring for this patient, because this is a very busy patient, there's a lot of people taking care of this because they're intubated. So do we cluster our interventions here? No, we have to, no, we have to space separate it out, them. Right, mm -hmm. we have to space it out because that's too much. <clears throat> Even though the patient mostly will be unconscious, they may go in and out. So we don't want excessive stimulation here. 
If none of those interventions uh, help, then the patient has to have surgery. So the doctor will perform a hemicraniectomy. So this will be a removal of a section of the skull. Have you heard of marsupialization? When they take a piece of skull out of your head and then put that skull in, in their belly. Cap. Okay, so that's what we call hemicranectomy. And this, this procedure of putting it in the patient's abdomen is called marsupialization. They can also store it in a tissue bank down in the lab, but it's better if we put it in the patient's abdomen because that's your own tissue. It will stay viable because it's your own tissue. Your, your body will supply it with, with blood. It will grow, your, your abdomen will grow vessels and then supply that piece of skull with, with, with blood supply. Okay, it's, it's automatic, you don't have to do that. You will automatically recognize it. Oh, this is, hey, where'd you, where'd you come from? Hey, okay, so here's blood flow, right? <clears throat> um, oh, um, so that means the patient is missing a piece of the skull now. So what happens to that portion of the head? Is it prone to injury? Yes. yes. So what should they be wearing when they're, whenever they're out of bed? Helmet. helmet. They will be wearing a helmet. Uh, it's not a, it's, it's a hard plastic helmet, doesn't have to be a heavy football helmet, you know, just a um, uh, uh, regular helmet, you know, a plastic helmet. So just so if the patient has any, you know, trauma, hits the wall, for instance, or falls, you know, at least the, the brain is protected because remember, they're missing a skull there. If you, if you, you know, it really feels weird because it, it, it's that area is like, it's, it's literally the, the, just the skin and a few muscles and then it's the brain already. Really soft. Um, for patients who have severe cases, uh, the patient will be put into a coma. Um, this will be uh, an induced coma. So uh, the coma will benefit the patient because they, it will suppress the uh, electrical activity in the brain as well as to decrease metabolic demand, therefore. So less brain activity, less oxygen demand, less oxygen consumption, the better the chances of healing. So it's, if it's not consuming that much um, oxygen, then it will... Uh, maximize the the oxygen that gets to it so you can use it to to heal instead of you know um, using it so much so these are the medications given to these patients uh, which are again when we get to intubation these are the same medications because these are intubated patients so we get morphine for pain and we assume they're in pain so we don't you know i mean not all these patients are, again, conscious, so they have to be, we assume that the patient has um, has pain. Then we keep them sedated. We use Bursed, or that's midazolam. Fentanyl is another one option for pain. And then here's the uh, sedative, propofol. And that's it. So keep monitoring the patient for signs of increased ICP. My mouse ran out of battery. Um, because these patients are intubated, so we have to suction, right? So please write, uh, read these whenever you suction, because we have to suction. Uh, make sure you perform pre-oxygenation. I mean, you know that, right? We hyperoxygenate before and after suctioning. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that the action itself, the suctioning itself, will cause hypoxia. It will cause increased ICP also. So to lessen the impact, you have to really hyperoxygenate. And there's the sedation and the mannitol or hypotonic saline. Um, and then we use the IVC catheter to uh, drain uh, CSF if, ne if necessary to lower ICP. And then keep the, because again, this is a severe injury. It will increase metabolic rate. It will increase 
uh, body temperature. So you keep the temperature low because again, if that goes high, causes vasodilation, increases ICP. And here are your other interventions. All right, so if the patient is, we mentioned the helmet, right? Yeah, so we put the helmet if they have a craniectomy. Yes. And that's it. Okay, take a break. Come back. Uh, we'll do um, traumatic brain injury. It should go faster because we have the basics already. Of How long is the break? Uh, come back at 11.